Hello Biotechnicals, this is Dr. Farhan Zameer from Biotechnica Bangalore. We had actually received a lot of queries on, uh, uh, you know, uh, sir, I am a PhD student, I am a master student, and I also want to publish certain papers. So uh, the students were actually confused on the various formats of the paper, and we thought that we actually explain the various or different types of scientific papers which could be actually published. So in this video, we will look into the various types of scientific papers which can be published either from master students, PhD students or postdoc students. Let's dive in. Welcome back. So as I was trying to tell you that for today, we would look into the different types of scientific papers which could be published uh, from a master's or a PhD or a postdoc student. So uh, in this video, the major focus is on the various formats in which a paper could be published or your scientific you know, findings could be published in very good you know, uh, pre-reviewed uh, publications which have been published by good publication houses. So, before we actually understand the various formats, I want you people to understand there are three different types of literatures which normally gets published. The first type of literature is called as the primary literature. The second type of literature is called as secondary literature and the third one is called as tertiary lit literature. Now it becomes very very crucial for us to understand these three major types because depending on this, the scientific papers or the types of scientific papers would differ. So let us try to look into what exactly is the primary literature. So the primary literature always talks on the original research work or the new research work or the new scientific discovery which has been bought in. And this is also called as original article or it is simply called as you know article when you are actually going into a, 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 an editorial submission which is called as an editorial manager there you have a tab which talks about an original research paper or it just says as uh, you know research paper so if your if your work or if your research findings is of uh, you know uh, your master's thesis or your phd thesis and you are the person who have actually uh, instrumental in creating that particular data, then please remember your data actually fits into the primary literature. Now, uh, uh, classical examples for this is, you know, uh, your dissertation work, your technical reports, and maybe uh, even certain conference proceedings can also come into primary literature. Now, moving on to the secondary literature, remember, secondary literature is the summarization or the synthesis which we have got it from the primary literature. So, usually this would be broader and many a times it is less current than the primary literature. So, you might be able to compile the data from on COVID from last three years or last two years, then this could not be considered as a primary literature, this could be always considered as a secondary literature. Now, example is, you know, writing reviews or writing book chapters, writing books would come into this particular section. Now, the third category is the tertiary literature and in tertiary literature, you are trying to summarize a huge component of last 10 years, which is a resultant of primary and secondary research work. And this you will try to compile into one finding, one condensed matter. And this condensed matter is called as a tertiary literature. And classical examples could be your textbooks, it could be encyclopedias, or it could be handbooks or dictionaries. So all this uh, is an example for tertiary literature. So before you actually proceed the, and in selecting what kind of scientific papers you want to publish, you need to always remember whether you have the primary data in your hand, secondary data in your hand, or tertiary data in your hand. Let's move on. Once I decide that this is the data, what I have, then, you know, again, the formats gets again, you know, segregated into, as I said, as primary source, secondary source, and tertiary source. Please remember, you need to always have a strategy to find whether your data fits into what tariff, what compartment of scientific publication. So normally, as I have already told you that, you know, a laboratory notebook or your experiments which comes from uh, your research findings or your 
your opinion on uh, a given paper which was already published in a in a reputed journal and you want to give a particular uh, you know commentary on it please remember this this section is not only for the freshers it is always for you know it is in an invited mode and then uh, most experienced researchers at least who have spent around 20 to 25 years of uh, in in a particular field they are eligible to write uh, uh, this, this section which is called as letter to the editor or commentary or short notes or you know uh, if you are also interested of if uh, to uh, to put up on a uh, bio sequence data this is also available then if you want to go something with ipr especially in terms of copyrights and patenting this is also considered as a primary source then if you are you know um, writing a dissertation thesis or a journal article okay all this would come under the primary source now when we talk about the secondary source already which has been published on the primary source then if you are utilizing the primary source and then creating your secondary data this comes under the the secondary data uh, uh, category which mainly involves the monographs or reviews or handbooks um, and uh, which are either in form of uh, indexed version or it is in form of abstracting so all these components would come under the secondary source the tertiary source is always cataloging wherein you are trying to catalog the source or the library or uh, the scientific literature which is already uh, proven through primary and secondary data this could be compiled into one bigger umbrella and this bigger umbrella is uh, the source of your tertiary data now as we have discussed uh, in research when if you consider uh, any of the phd student or a postdoc student or a master student uh, i would not uh, you know uh, confine uh, a student to a review of literature or towards another mode because what we have seen through our experiences most of the time all these category of students they always have primary articles they always have the primary source of data with them and for them publishing a uh, uh, original article or at least a short communication becomes very very crucial so all those empirical data comes under the primary sources now secondary sources uh, if you are a bit experienced or if you know that you are trying to put up at least you know uh, I have uh, worked on my PhD thesis uh, especially on my review of literature uh, for the last three years if that is the case now I know the updates from the last three years and I feel that with this experience of these three years I can compile uh, the, the topic of my interest uh, into a review into a short review we also call it as a mini review or a mega review okay uh, which is also called as a metadata uh, review if you are able to do it uh, either you can go on to a narrative review or you can go for a systematic review so these are again um, the sources of your secondary data articles Apart from that, I was also trying to mention that there are certain special uh, calls, special invitations for uh, a category which are called as special articles. Now, these special articles normally uh, they are being preferred to be written by experienced researchers, mentors, or supervisors, or principal investigators. And many a times, uh, the 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 format is called as letter to the editor, which comes in just one page. Uh, correspondence which comes in a small paragraph of one or two and then uh, you have short communication which is restricted for not more than two or three pages and then you have the editorials uh, which is again uh, depending on uh, the aim and scope of the journal uh, normally it is not exceeding more than two to three pages then commentary also uh, it is many a times it is of one page and very importantly there is a beautiful scheme which has been now started up and this is which is called as pictorial uh, 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 you know write-ups or essays so these pictorial essays will only you need to narrate the entire story in form of a picture and this is much more effective because as we know one picture talks about thousand words so uh, the 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 idea gets easily embossed into the minds of the reader using uh, pictorial articles then uh, you have an other format which are called as news articles 
Now in news articles, say for example, uh, I, have, uh, I have done uh, uh, a significant work which can also help the layman directly or I have developed a technology which can directly help a farmer. So under this condition, okay, me uh, writing an article and this article will go into the publisher's house and this can take pre-reviewing for six months or eight months. But however, not all laymen would read your scientific literature. So what I do is I make an additional effort to pen down my scientific findings in such a way that the common layman understands this. So this comes into a special category which is called as news articles wherein you are trying to brief down your entire scientific work into the layman's language which is much more read by and understood and which has been adapted by the society. So here you have a transition which can help your scientific research findings go directly to the end user. Then, uh, suppose I know I am into a department and uh, I know I am into a college or a university. So I would conduct a, a seminar or a conference or a symposia. Now I invite for certain papers. Now these papers either they could be in the form of an abstract or they could be in a full length article. Now under these conditions, I can actually take up an ISBN or ISSN uh, number and then with, with prior permission with all the authors, I can, I can actually publish this as a book as uh, which is called as proceedings. So this is also an other format. This is also considered as one of the publication. So, but however, these, the, they don't carry any kind of impact factors. So it, it becomes always important for you to know which article should go into what category of research papers. Then, uh, the, the classical mode wherein you have the research articles. Now in research articles you have the long form of research article which can go into pages. Please remember do not write your, uh, you know, uh, your article more than 30 type 10 A4 pages because when it goes into a uh, final galley proof, okay, this can be condensed somewhere around you know, 10 to 12 pages. Uh, but beyond this, if you are writing, many a times, you know, the, the, the editor would request you to cut down the, uh, the words because for a maximum, uh, you know, article, the, uh, the word limit is somewhere around 6,000 to 8,000 uh, words. So always stick down to that particular, uh, you know, word limit, which will always help you from not getting rejected. Now, also present very importantly, the, the current work which has been available in the research and the previous work which can actually back up your current problem statement. So this also creates uh, the originality and supports the data of uh, your findings and also tries to refute or argues uh, or will aid in supporting your data uh, in which you are trying to actually uh, you know, define it. Then uh, also try to mention the research methodologies as brief as possible and uh, until and unless you have designed a new methodology, try to give it in detail. But uh, say for example, if you have uh, done a protein estimation and as you know that protein estimation is when the, was first, uh, you know, uh, the methodology was given by uh, Lowry et al. Now if that's the case, do not go on explaining the entire Lowry et al method saying that you took up a bovine serum, albumin, etc, etc and then you took uh, Lowry's reagent and did the entire protocol just to say that protein estimation was done using Lowry's Lowry et al method and then just put that particular reference you know that's how from a big paragraph you have reduced down to one particular line because if somebody is truly interested with Lowry et al method they will go and read the the, the citation or the, the cross referred uh, text wherein they have the entire uh, you know idea of how exactly Lowry method could be done so it becomes very very important the way you actually cite and cross cite uh, you know others work in your particular uh, uh, you know, uh, research paper. Also, uh, try to compile data. What I have seen, because I am into a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, panels into international and uh, national reviewer board, uh, where we see is, you know, uh, all the all the authors are very confined and beautifully they write introduction part and then they come on to the methods and methodologies, again, beautifully written. But the major lacunae, what we find is in the component of the results and discussion. So it is very, very, very crucial the way you, you try to express your 
your result and it is not necessary that every time you try to align with the previous data which is already available so it is always okay to get a negative data it is always okay uh, to get deviated from the true value if there is a deviation of the true value you need to always justify what might be the you know reason for your data to get deviated so now um, many a times these deviations has actually led into the emergence of newer fields so that you can think out of the box so just make sure do not try to manipulate or align your data with the previous data which is available in that particular field so it is also okay to show negative data and it is also show you know it is uh, nice to know that your data is also deviating and what is the reason for the deviation if you are able to make it out then you know your discussion becomes much more effective then uh, if you are if you are looking into uh, the, the reviews again uh, reviews has to be written in a much more concrete way again there are two kinds of reviews one is the uh, the mega review or it is simply called as the comprehensive review or the other one is called as short review or it is also called as mini review so writing this mini reviews um, uh, would be of prime importance and for mini reviews you need to select the burning topics which would be much more relevant for the scientific society and for the uh, societal uh, systems so if you are able to write your mini reviews in this particular perspective so uh, getting uh, citations uh, would be of uh, uh, greater possibilities so also uh, very importantly because the moment your article comes into the the world wide web so the, you know your your article will be read across the globe so managing your your grammar managing your hyphenations managing your phraseologies managing your your sentence formation that is basically your grammar specially becomes very very important and hence if you are not able to write it in a much better way uh, you have uh, the premier versions of lot of tools uh, which comes on a nominal uh, you know subscription such as grammarly or you can also look into certain uh, or take a help of uh, some english native speaker who can actually help in correcting your manuscript then finally this is a new version wherein uh, if you are reading uh, the current newspapers initially the newspapers the daily newspapers would be only of the politics sports cinema etc now uh, thanks to uh, the science journalism wherein there is a complete editorial or the complete uh, you know uh, supplements which comes exclusively for science and wherein popular articles have been written news articles with regard to science have been written and this is called as you know science journalism because we are we are uh, especially in india we have dearth for science journalists wherein uh, you know the people who do pure journalism they don't understand science and science uh, you know uh, uh, p graduates they are not able to translate science into the common layman common layman language so science journalism actually acts as a bridge between the scientific fraternity and the societal component which can actually uh, once get combined can give a huge fruit wherein the the research what you have done in your laboratory could be translated into the field okay or translated into the bench or you can translate into the bedside of a patient so this can create a huge impact so what i was trying to make you understand is the various formats and you should really know in which kind of a category your data actually fits in hope this particular video is of uh, help for you in categorizing uh, your your original article or your review article or your tertiary data thank you very much for joining in stay connected thank you